So when uh, Dr. Ross Davies sent me this topic, I almost fell off my chair because he gave me 15 minutes and said, talk about AFib. So I said, I'll talk about AFib management up to 2033, so I don't have to repeat this talk. <laughs> anyway, it's a, it's a, it's a tough uh, task to talk to this audience because I see thought leaders in different specialties in cardiology and you know I interact with everybody and I know that their level of knowledge is up there. So <clears throat> it was, it, it, it is a difficult 15 minutes, but <clears throat> I have no, no disclosure for this uh, presentation. And I thought, how do I do it without you know, reinventing the wheel and talking about things probably you know from before? So I, I, I said, let me review AFIP publications over the last two years, and Ross specifically told me only two or three important points, um, two or three important aspects of AFIP. So I sifted through the evidence, which included about 4,000 articles, and I identified what are the important questions people are asking. Then I identified uh, the high impact journals, you know, highlighting a few key points. And then I'm going to present those articles to you in a very uh, you know, straightforward, simplified fashion. So, but I must share with you, of the 4,000 articles I reviewed, these were the hot topics that are going on. People are trying to really understand the epidemiology of AFib. We have piecemeal information from small regions, and there were a couple of landmark trials, which I'll quickly summarize, uh, from the world over, from, North, from Europe, and then from Ontario, which sort of gives you an insight into what the true epidemiology of AFib is and what happens to these patients. We have to revisit the age-old debate of rate versus rhythm control and present whatever has happened over the last two years. How do you optimally manage patients in the emergency department? Uh, catheter and surgical ablation or non-pharmacological therapies for rhythm control. Gene discovery, I'm not going to talk about it. I'm not the right person. Biomarkers, just to give a snippet, and again, I'm not the right person, so I won't focus on it. Detection of occult AF is a big topic in a lot of publications over the last two years. Stroke risk stratification schemes and the newer oral anticoagulants. And now, I mean, I was very glad I don't have to talk on this because Dr. Wells will follow me and uh, it's, he will talk about those things. Very briefly on imaging and other uh, markers to identify atrial remodeling. Um, again, the age old, what do you do in the subset of people who have congestive heart failure? And finally, cost benefit analysis. And 2014 had two new guidelines, both the ACC, AHA, and CCS brought out new guidelines. To discuss them in detail would take a long time, but I'll just stress on the new recommendations from these guidelines on the two or three topics I'm going to highlight today. With that, I'll go on to the actual presentation. So uh, this was a nice study that came out in circulation this year where they were looking at worldwide epidemiology of atrial fibrillation, and why I'm presenting it here is there are differences, and probably we can learn from the rest of the world. Uh, to find out how we can change our treatment, management, and so on and so forth, and also the understanding of the disease. Now, this, I must uh, tell you, was a systematic review where uh, these uh, lead authors from Europe uh, and, and North America got uh, funds to look at published data from different countries all over the world. And, and the interesting or striking thing is that AFib is the, the biggest, highest prevalence is in North America, which you know, Canada and the U.S. are included. And countries uh, that are somewhat comparable with older populations have very low incidence of uh, AFib, like the Scandinavian countries, Japan, and to a certain extent Australia and uh, you know um, Western European companies. Which you know you think that these are uh, countries which will report conditions well and have the same kind of uh, you know population distribution, but they have low, much lower incidence of AFib, and um, the. Two key points that came out is that in any age group, any subgroup, uh, males are more likely to have AFib than women. However, the absolute mortality rate may be higher in males because there are more males with AFib. But adjusted uh, for the numbers, women have a higher relative uh, risk of dying, uh, mortality due to AFib. And, and that is something that came out from this. We, people knew about it, but this has come out on a large scale with a huge number of uh, you know, subjects that were evaluated as part of this trial. And the other f very interesting thing is, this is actually AFib attributable mortality, albeit it's retrospective and reported. If you notice, 
all along the uh, Western European Scandinavian countries in Australia, the age at, I mean, the attributable, attributable mortality due to AFib is much higher than, say, in North America or others. I mean, I'm not going into India and other countries because the spectrum of AFib patients are different, the population is different, and reporting is not that good. But this was striking. Either we are under-attributing uh, death due to AFib in North America, or there's something else with the population where the lower incidence, you know, the people who come with AFib are more likely to die. I don't know. They are exploring these, and this is probably something that will help uh, people run trials and look at uh, how AFib is different and probably will help us manage AFib in 2033 because we are not looking into these factors now. Then the next study was a very uh, nice, very controlled study from one country, which is Sweden, which is, we know has got excellent health records, managed the patients. What they did is they went back to 1990 and followed up every patient coming to the hospital with new onset, first episode of AFib, and through linked registries, they have a very nice tight network, they followed them up for 30, 30 years or so to see what happens to a person who comes in with your first episode of AFib, which we don't have large studies. I mean, this was, um, so this had 272,000 AFib patients with age, sex, and comorbidity match controls two to one, 544. And what was clear is that AFib clearly, in this, these are people without any AFib before, they had their first episode, and they were longitudinally followed up for decades. And AFib clearly showed uh, AFib attributable mortality and mortality in general to be much higher than eight sex mat controls who did not have AFib. And what's the other information we got? Busy slide, but the only message is that AFib is definitely a disease of uh, old age. As you grow older, you're more likely to get AFib, and that Comorbidities are very common, especially coronary artery disease, hypertension, obesity, renal disease. Secondly, they looked at patients who presented primarily with AFib, not AFib as a secondary diagnosis, and they found that they were slightly younger and they had fewer comorbidities, but slowly, as time went by, they started developing other morbidity and mortality, uh, other morbidities associated with AFib and had a higher incidence of um, you know, persistent permanent AFib. So they would transition from paroxysmal AFib into persistent AFib. So these are things which we, we thought we knew, but never were shown in a nice longitudinal registry. So this, this was, I think, uh, the key messages was, were that AFib increases mortality independent of concomitant diseases in the largest natural history study, uh, you know, that we have till now. AF incidence increases with age, associated comorbidities. Again, in this study, Women have a higher relative mortality risk. So if you have to look at uh, people, I mean, that's one area people are targeting research on. Then this is from Ontario. And this shows emergency department visits for AFib over the last eight years. And there's been a steady up, uh, uptrend. There are more and more people attending emergencies in Ontario with AFib. But what, is, what we're noticing is that the one-year mortality, re-hospital admission, uh, stroke rate, 30-day mortality, all have been flat or have been coming down a bit. And what this tells us essentially that AFib is on the rise. However, uh, we seem to be managing it quite okay and the management has stepped out into the outpatient department because these people are not coming back to the emergency again and again. So that's encouraging and that sort of is one of our concerns is if you have a person with AFib, I mean, do you really need to admit him? And, you know, are they going to the emergency again and again? There are a few frequent flyers, but they are different. So that, I thought, was a nice one. Then I'll step over to uh, one of the commonest problems, uh, even all my colleagues asked me, I mean, rate control, how do we go about it? Now, I think Dr. Uh, Charlie Kerr and Dr. Andrew Cran were behind this paper and, you know, they lo looked at all the uh, evidence and based on public demand, that is demand from our colleagues, they came up with a sort of sensible algorithm on how to manage patients. When you want to rate control, what do you do? I think uh, you will appropriately stroke, uh, do, take appropriate measures for stroke prevention and then really intervene only if the heart rate is over 100 beats per minute and there are significant AF-related symptoms associated with the uh, heart rate. And two common settings, whether the patient is hypertensive or has normal uh, or low blood pressure. If the patient has hypertension, then you look at normal LV or LV ejection fraction. 
If there is normal LV, then calcium channel blockers, non-dihydropyridines are preferred because they are better antihypertensive agents. But if the LV ejection fraction is lower, a beta blocker may be tried as first line uh, drug. However, if the blood pressure is normal, irrespective of the LV function, a beta blocker is sort of a sensible first line option. And even after treating, if the heart rate remains to be, uh, remains still over 100, then you add a beta blocker. Now, digoxin has been downgraded as a second line agent and doesn't appear here. That's one of the changes they have made. And it's mainly used in uh, subjects with a poor ejection fraction or low, L low blood pressure. And if the heart rate remains uh, high and the patient is symptomatic, then we go to non-pharmacological treatments. So that, that is the current uh, target heart rate and, and is sort of a sensible way to do it. It's not based on large randomized trials, but it's more based on consensus and expertise. The second article I found which was interesting with the rate rhythm control, uh, this thing was from Dr. Paul Dorian and his colleagues that came out uh, recently. And they used the CCF uh, severity of AF scale and showed that as the scale goes up, you're more likely to utilize the emergency room and you know, utilize heart uh, care resources. Therefore, there is merit to aiming for uh, sinus rhythm and maintaining rhythm. However, uh, and also they showed that when you are in sinus rhythm, uh, your exercise capacity, your symptoms, everything are much better. But the biggest challenge so far, and there's nothing much to add other than highlight these points, is that rate control, pharmacological rate control has been very challenging, mainly because rhythm control agents are either ineffective or toxic. And the second major problem is all our trials like Affirm and so on and so forth have looked at efficacy endpoints, hard endpoints like stroke, death, and so on and so forth uh, to evaluate these treatment strategies. And it's going to be almost impossible to cure AFib in most patients. And if you look at these hard endpoints, then probably you're not looking at what the patient wants, which is symptomatic relief, and not come to the emergency. So you have to look at more effectiveness trials where you change the endpoint into quality of life and this understanding that your ultimate aim is not to cure AFib or you know, even reduce uh, MACE events, maybe not possible. Practically, we have four antiarrhythmic drugs that we use commonly. Ronadron and dofetilide, unfortunately, are rarely used. There's a lot of data coming in, partly because of the negative uh, results from Palace and the fact that it's really not a strong antiarrhythmic agent, but it's still in the guidelines. Uh, newer atrial-specific uh, inhibitors are being developed, but nothing has come out. And, um, you know, Dr. Dorian and his colleagues feel that we have to look away from curing and hard endpoints rather and look at can we attain, can we use rhythm control strategies to give the patient quality of life and prevent hospital admissions and things like that. And to highlight the point, there, were two, there was this large meta-analysis done on rate versus rhythm control studies, which looked at hard endpoints like death, strokes, and cardiovascular outcomes, and rhythm and rate control strategies uh, in these randomized trials and large trials were no different. It's no beneficial. You could do one or the other. Uh, but when it came to a special subgroup that is highly symptomatic younger patients, then a lot of the trials showed that if you do uh, catheter ablation in them compared to first-line antiarrhythmic medication, you are more likely to keep them or reduce their symptoms and reduce hospital admissions. And so the key thing is if you're looking at elderly subjects with minimally symptomatic AFib, Rhythm and rate control strategies are equally effective with respect to hard endpoints such as stroke and mortality. There is a, sub, there is a nice study from Dr. Denis Roy and a group in Montreal from the AF-CHF trial which said that rhythm control strategies initially were thought to be very expensive, but that's not true. Even rate control strategies are effective, are expensive, in fact, more expensive than rhythm control strategies in patients with heart failure because you end up putting more pacemakers and a lot of other things. So it's not clearly a cost thing either. I, I'm not going to present that. But in younger subjects with symptomatic AFib, these are the frequent flyers, the ones that come to the emergency and trouble us. Uh, you know, antiarrhythmic medications are difficult. So coming to, uh, with that, well, we published this trial in 2004, early 2004. We randomized patients to antiarrhythmic medication versus catheter ablation. And the bottom line is that you can't cure AFib, there is a recurrence rate, but the recurrence rate is lower with catheter ablation compared to antiarrhythmic drugs. And um, 
CCS uh, and American guidelines have incorporated this, and, and, and we'll discuss uh, this sort of as a guideline as to whom to send for ablation. Now, if there is a patient with paroxysmal aphid who's relatively young, very symptomatic, and has failed multiple drugs, or failed a second line or a first line drug, there's a sort of clear indication to send them for catheter ablation. But they have put sort of one tick mark, which is their visual score for referring patients for catheter ablation, and they've said, you may consider uh, sending them as for first line catheter ablation. I think uh, I'll show you a slide from Dr. George Weiss, who was asked to write an editorial on this, uh, as to what the limitations are and why you can't send everybody for catheter ablation. However, in this subgroup, uh, uh, that is paroxysmals frequently um, visiting ERs, highly symptomatic, you may opt, opt for first-line catheter ablation. For long-standing uh, abl and persistent ablation, we are still not, uh, we don't still have very good results, and most of them are research trials. We have a CAHR-sponsored trial looking at ablation in these long-standing and persistent AFIBs. So right now, I would say if they fail multiple drugs, uh, you know, you have a couple of attempts at cardioversion, and, and then the patient is not responding, is highly symptomatic, uh, we, we can consider them, and we are, have some ongoing trials. So what is the problem, or what, why, do, why can't we just send everybody for catheter ablation? So I think Dr. Weiss, who's a, you know, he's going to come give it a MAR lecture next year too, uh, brought out a, a, a few issues. And he says that, you know, the long-term Im impact on death, stroke, and CHF, uh, you know, can catheter ablation prevent these things? And I think going from the rate rhythm literature, I'm not sure we can ever show that doing a catheter ablation will reduce mor morbidity, mortality, and so on and so forth. There is an ongoing trial called Cabana for which I think the Mayo Clinic has got close to $140 million. And that is looking at hard uh, endpoints. But that is a problem. So the question is, do you want to submit somebody for uh, a catheter ablation if uh, you want to prevent uh, downstream strokes and so on and so forth. I don't think we are there yet. So then the next question is, is slowing progression or symptom relief a valid uh, concept as an indication? I think it is uh, in young symptomatic people, yes. Is it cost effective and long-term effectiveness? And you know you have results from ablation trials, but what's the real, real life experience and, and what's the real life thing? So real life experience with catheter ablation. I think if catheter ablation are totally benign without serious complications, then we could have strongly put two or three more ticks in the first box. But since we all know that there are some potentially serious side effects from catheter ablation, it is still with the reservation that the CCS and American societies have recommended as first line, but definitely for failed antiarrhythmic therapy, it's a sensible option. So this is sort of the CCS's uh, algorithm for rhythm control choices in normal systolic function, no CHF, paroxysmal AFib. You try the anti medications, then the, the common ones, then go to amiodarone and then do catheter ablation. However, the person is very young and they're, you, know, you don't want to put them on amiodarone forever, you may consider this as first line. However, with CHF or LV systolic dysfunction, catheter ablation is still a research uh, procedure. And I, I have a feeling that um, it's not going to be as uh, widespread uh, in its use as for paroxysmal AFIBs with normal LV function. Then a um, couple more slides. Uh, there is a big push, uh, I mean, you know, towards biomarkers. What do biomarkers uh, add? I mean, there are multiple biomarkers looking at endothelial dysfunction, fibrosis, genetics, myocardial stress injury on the AFib, and they are being used to sort of, uh, to, to predict outcomes, quality of life, morbidity, mortality, and stroke, et cetera. But the big question is, uh, it's a research tool for sure, and, uh, but how can it translate to cost-effective, easy-to-apply scores? And that seems to be the big challenge. And people are looking at different um, biomarkers and ongoing studies, but it seems that it's not going to be easy to apply at the, on the bedside unless you get a uh, and some of the interesting things are adding high sensitivity troponin to a chart score to predict stroke and you know give a better estimate, especially uh, given the clinical uh, limitations. But we've gone through this with uh, risk stratification and sun cardiac death, and ultimately we came down to LV ejection fraction after all the other sophisticated tests. 
So there's a lot of research and a lot of publications going on there. Lastly, with imaging, the Utah group, which not many other groups have been able to replicate, did a neat study where they looked at patients with atrial fibrillation and using a, their own uh, proprietary uh, technique, assessed the amount of scar in the atria. And you can see these green spots are scar, and they classified patients into four groups, stage one to four, uh, based on an arbitrary <coughs> division of the proportion of atrial wall that's replaced by fibrosis. 10, 10 to 20 percent, 20 to 30 percent, and more than 30 percent. And then they tried to perform catheter ablations and look at results. So they found that as, the proportion, as, as you get more scar, you're more likely to have paroxysmal or persistent AFib. And if you have lots of scar, your recurrence of AFib is very high. And the people who do best after a catheter ablation are the ones who are in this group where there's minimal scar. This is conceptually very uh, interesting and you know, sort of tries to make sense on how you identify people for and select them for AFib in the sense, if you have 30 or 40% scar, maybe it's futile to attempt anything and it's just better to accept uh, atrial fibrillation rather than chase this. But you know, there are, there are, there, so the key message from the biomarker and the AFib study is that, uh, the MRI story is that you need to identify structural remodeling in subject with AFib and this may help target your therapies. And this needs to be systematically rolled out. However, the problem is the Utah scoring and the methods have not been validated elsewhere, though a lot of other people are trying it. A case in point is I had a patient whose son is a radiologist in Stanford, and he called me and said, uh, I, we turned him down for AFib because he was in long-standing AFib. So he said, why don't you do the Utah classification and this? I said, at our institution, we are not doing it, but can you get it done at Stanford? So he said, yeah, I'll do it. But then two days later, he calls back and says, Stanford group is also not able to do it. <laughs> so that is sort of, it's uh, only the Utah group that has shown us this. So we have to wait till they <clears throat> are able to replicate this in different institutions. And then that brings into this position paper, which is the title of my talk, year 2033. I mean, you know, four or five of our uh, leaders in this field in Canada wrote this paper, including Dr. Stanley Nattel, who does a lot of basic research. Uh, it's sort of a sort of synthesis of all that we know uh, and telling us to shift away from just uh, very clinically based decision making to personalized and uh, targeted, uh, uh, you know, treatment for individuals. So this is a busy slide, but, but here is what we do in 2013 which is, I mean, you look at rhythm and rate control strategies, you look at paroxysmal and persistent AFib, you have CHAT score, you look at oral anticoagulations, and then, you know, rhythm control, if it fails, you go on back to uh, rate control. So what they are suggesting in this busy slide <laughs> is that you have to refine uh, the thromboembolic risk stat uh, score using, bi they have suggested biomarkers, imaging, a lot of other things, and then go away from just the concept of rate and rhythm control rather than, and looking at uh, phenotypes like paroxysmal and persistent AFib and go on to individualized genetically based understanding of a person's AFib and then target therapy or treat the person based on that. Now, this is a bit of a stretch and I'm not sure I agree with all they say, but uh, uh, I, I think uh, there has to be ongoing research to find out. Now, AFib is not the same for everybody and there is some merit to understanding some, I think this Dr. Green is uh, quite uh, uh, an important proponent of understanding phenotypes. And I think that there is merit to that. But we'll see whether uh, this will happen in 2033 or not. <laughs> so to summarize, there's a worldwide epidemic clearly of AFib and it's a public health problem. There are multiple pathogenetic mechanisms so you can't say that all AFib is because of one particular reason. It independently clearly contributes to mortality and morbidity. And I, in my review of literature, I, just, I don't think a cure seems to be in sight for most cases. The manage, management is very challenging, and as we've seen, there are differences in regional incidents, outcomes, and treatment. So, I mean, I think you'll have to have a good mixture of uh, individual and regional strategies to treat AFib. And there has to be a concerted effort where there's a multidisciplinary team to treat AFib rather than one person uh, doing it. I think as an electrophysiologist, we or an arrhythmia specialist, we deal with one aspect of AFib, but it's a chronic recurrent disease model that affects the whole body, so. 
Those are, I mean, these are the insights I gathered from all the publications over the last two years. And there are many more issues, but you know, in, in the interest of time and remaining on two or three issues, uh, that's all I have to say. I'm happy to answer questions.